really appreciate you taking time out to come and join us for this very important topic. And uh, we always like to start on the right foot, so we'll start with prayer and uh, ask our brother Jamal to do that for us. Jamal? Okay, so what we will do, I will um, do it. Um, let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you so much for this opportunity that we can come together and discuss issues that impact our entire society, uh, whether you are black, white, or gray, or whatever denomination you may belong to, it would also impact all of us. So we ask you, O oh God, that you will give us clarity of thought and wisdom and that we, everything will be done in decency and in order. And at the end of it all, we will all benefit going forward for this country that we love so dearly. We thank you for hearing us in Jesus' name. Amen. So tonight, we have the topic, Rooting Out Violent Crime, Keys to Success. And we always need to have solutions, so therefore, we need to know what we need to do. On the panel, we have an eminent panel here. We have the Deputy Commissioner of Police, Irwin Boyce. We have the Chairman of uh, Drug and Education and Counseling Services, uh, Roger Husbands. And we have the Community Leader, Winston Eiston Branch with us. Um, criminologist, uh, Vernie Sobers is to join us um, in due course. So what I want to do is to have each one just say in two minutes or less your background in terms of this particular issue, you know, what you do, your work, um, so that we can appreciate um, you being here to contribute to this very important topic. So I want to start first with, um, I don't want to say age before beauty, but we will start with uh, um, Deputy Commissioner Erin Boyce. Uh, thank you very much, uh, <clears throat> Mr. Joseph. Uh, it's always a privilege to join in to debate a matter that is as critical as this one. And as I'm here just to give you an introduction of, as to who I am, Yes, I'm the Deputy Commissioner of Police, uh, Barbados Police Service. And I have had a, a long time doing crime investigation as well as uh, police administration. And I would have had some experience in, in from an academic perspective on, on uh, the uh, criminology and sociology. So uh, it, it's kind of blended this afternoon. I'm going to be speaking from a police perspective. And at the same time, I'm going to be able to draw on my own experience, uh, hoping that I can produce some solutions and I can build a relationship that is stronger, uh, public versus police or public and police. And uh, uh, we can work, work together to solve this problem. So this is Erwin Boyce, uh, Deputy Commissioner of Police. Thank you so much. Um, next, we'll get Roger Husbands. Can you give your worth, your, as they say, their two cents worth? Okay, um, a blessed night to you. Um, I'm trying to still find myself. I was doing a lot of things just now, so um, do excuse me. Uh, but however, um, good night. Thank you for the invitation. I am a, uh, Social work well, counselor, um, the chairman of Drug Education Council Services. Um, I've been working in this field for many years. I am the person who at first brought it to the public of concern the gangs in Barbados. Um, and what we're seeing today, um, I am I think that everyone knows by now that I'm very outspoken and I would say what I have to say. And you know, I'm hoping that I would be respected on that fact, but however. 
Um, I am glad to be here with you today, and I hope that we can have some uh, powerful solutions. And hopefully, somebody in higher places will hear the solutions and somehow um, look to you know to use these solutions to help what we what I what I'm calling now uh, uh, a pandemic uh, of, of of its proportion. And um, and although government and government officials may not want to alert you guys or make you feel scared. I, however, believe that it is a problem that we have in our nation that needs to be addressed. And um, and I hope that we can have some very robust discussion tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much, Roger. Winston? Winston, are you hearing me? Um, yes, oh, yeah. uh, yeah. can you hear me now? Yeah, we are, we are hearing you. Go ahead. Okay, um, good evening. My name is uh, Winston Branch. I'm one known as Einstein. And you could really say that I come from the ghetto, come from the streets, come from majority from the topic of today. Because the topic of today is crime violence, which is mostly affect the poor, which is inside the ghettos and things. So, I decide that you know, after living a life like that and see where it comes to you know at this time, I don't like it because I don't think it's right. And I would like to see it going up further, especially becoming a generational curse. We are really saying that um, you kill my father, you kill my aunt, and it keep on going on like that. Yeah. You know what I mean? So whatever I could see or whatever I could do, I like to use my influence here today. Um, a lot of people they say that I shouldn't be in a forum like this. You know what I mean? But if if somebody don't step forward that is involved, you understand what I mean? To say certain things, how will it change? Because um, I just can't get the people from universities and the schools and all these different places to come and speak and somebody from the ghetto don't speak because it's a fact we do. You know what I mean? And one of the things that hurt me today you now is to see that young men surrendering the better part of their life to go jail for 30 or 40 years and that none of them even raise a letter you know, so hard jail is and it's not a place to go and think. You know what I mean? It come like um, I want my mother don't care if the whole world blind. You know, so I think we should do better than that. And... Thank you so much, Winston. So what we're going to do is get right into it, into the meat of the matter. So I would like each person to give an overview of their thoughts. First of all, their thoughts on how they see this crime wave affecting us and some of the things that we can do as a society and as individuals to get to the root of it and address it for the sake of this country. So we will start with the people, with the person who deals with this on a day-to-day -day basis in terms of um, law enforcement and to give that foundation and so we can feed off of that afterwards. Um, Mr. Boyce? Yes, thank you very much again, Chair. Um, I, I don't think I am in agreement with you that there is a crime wave. Uh, I am suggesting to you, yes, there are troubling issues as it relates to crime. There is a crime of violence that perhaps is, is, is making its wrongs in terms of uh, creating imaginations and provoking fear of crime. But were we to look at our stats, our recorded stats, because obviously you're gonna, you, you're gonna argue that uh, there's maybe many, many, many unreported crimes. We would recognize that were we looking from January to, to let's say last week, 
we will realize that there is about a 6% decrease in the overall crime. And uh, apart from uh, the homicides, the murders, uh, the other crimes are marginal in terms of, uh, of increase or decrease. And the bulk of the criminal activity is founded in, in what we would call the minor offenses, the offenses that that have, in, in most instances, some degree of domestic relations. So I, I, I'm not going to uh, endorse that there is a crime wave. I'm going to suggest to you there are some troubling issues in terms of criminal activity that had presented themselves at this time, and in addition to, to, to creating uh, the fear of crime, it has caused uh, a society to become, I, I don't want to say fearful, but to be over imaginative when it comes to criminal activity. And uh, I, I go back to say, yes, there is that level of of fear, and fear is driving the interpretation of our reported crimes. So in a nutshell, uh, the Barbados Police Service is concerned about this troubling development, and we are equally concerned about the level of fear uh, that that kind of information is having on our society. So that is, in, in a nutshell, my opening remarks. I'm sure somebody will take you up on that <laughs> um, crime wave aspects of time later. So we, okay. we, we need, what we will do, what we want to do on this is, is to be very frank, but um, frank and but with respect, respect each other, but you can be open and frank and uh, just but be respectful. So. We are, we are adults on, on, this, on this platform, so we can be very open. And because that is one way of getting to the bottom of anything. Is like they tell me that if you are an alcoholic, the first thing you have to do is admit that you're an alcoholic. So we have to get to the bottom of it and the real cause before we can really find a solution. So the next person we want to have the opening remarks is our brother husbands. Sorry, give, give me the question again. Oh. Oh, you open your remarks on an overview of, of the situation. All right, so, so okay. And let's, let's be real. Um, over the years, we've been seeing uh, an increase, and I uh, appreciate um, uh, the Deputy Commissioner's um, sentiment. However, uh, from, our, from my point of view and from my where I stand uh, without stats because I don't trust stats. That's, that's me. I'm not saying to you that you can't trust stats. I'm just saying that I don't trust stats uh, because you normally go to do, do people who are, um, all right, let me leave that. But I don't, I don't trust stats. Uh, how I'm seeing it and based upon the information I am receiving uh, from informants that I work with closely, uh, with, um, and also with persons um, who uh, give me information, uh, this thing has now become a big problem. I One of the things that I am so happy about, and I want to say before any reservations whatsoever, I am very happy that the prime minister of this country, and I am not a political person, I try to stay away from those things because I want to be able to have my own voice. But I'm glad that the Prime Minister of Barbados have decided to bring to Parliament this to change the deal art situation because this is going to be one of the biggest changers uh, that Barbados will ever see when crime when, when it comes about from crime, a crime perspective. Um I go to schools, I speak at youth services, I I I go into the uh, homes of people who got children we taught, and the first thing children just always tell me is that how it is that a man could go and kill another man and still go and walk the street a couple of months after. And, and, and so young people and uh, 
in our society believe that you can go and sit down for a little bit and they can get bail and come out. So addressing that problem, I, 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 if I was not a political person, I would go with my prime minister and I would go and vote for Shane, whatever, whatever. <laughs> because I was so happy. Listen, I was ecstatic. I was driving and they had a pullover and just shout for joy because finally somebody is listening. Finally. And I've said that from the beginning when I came up with gangs, I talked about the gang legislation, anti-gang legislation. I talked about the bill. I, I talked about all of those things to be changed. And finally, after much years, we see that it is a problem. As a matter of fact, it was a problem long time ago where we buried our head and decided not to deal with the problem. And now the problem is at its level. Um, and I know obviously uh, persons here uh, uh, have to keep things a little cover up, but guys, we got a big problem up there. And matter of fact, what the big problems we have up there is a lot of revenge killing, a lot of territorial wars. And matter of fact, on Saturday alone, I heard that there is going to be a revenge for uh, one of the killings that will be happening recent time that was uh, that took place. And the problem is, is that we have these problems. And the end, I only know people, other people know in higher authority knows what's going on. They know what is going on. And, I, and, and matter of fact, the police is working tirelessly hard to deal with this problem. And I, I, I know for sure that if the police had more information for the public who want to hide things up, and they want to talk and open them up because you know we got this thing about barbers, about snitching, and you should not snitch and stitch, snitch, it, stitches get stitches and all kind of foolishness, which we're burying in children's head, allowing them not to save things when things are happening. Even in school, we got children going to school and knowing crime happening in the school. I can't see that because the first thing I check and say, I am not a snitch. And we burying that in their heads with the songs on radio, with all the the, the social media stuff that is causing them not to speak out, making the police job a little bit more difficult. Although we want to solve this problem. A matter of fact, I can go even, I, I can move even now to parents. I have said, and I, I can repeat over and over, I don't know who wants to invite me to these things, because I can just say over and over. I am a big advocate that parents need to be responsible and take responsibility for these problems. Yeah, I'm glad that the Americans realize that when a young boy goes to school and shoot off uh, uh, somebody, shoots from people in there, the parents are the persons responsible and must face some charges too. When are we going to come to the point where we start to tell these parents that they need to take responsibility, so spell them at the court, spell them at police, spell them at counseling agencies, uh, rather than going and get them some help or, or, or facing the fact that you are a parent and you are responsible for them. If you see your child starting to behave, Matter of fact, start behaving at a small, tiny age from six, seven, eight, nine years old. Get the child some help. That's your responsibility. Don't wait till it starts now to go and get trouble in school and burn somebody's head or stop at somebody or, or cuss a teacher or be disrespectful. That then you can want to get them some help. Get them some help in the early. And Thank you, Roger. Parents, and then the parents you. don't know. Parents do know that there are problems. Thank you, Roger. So we know you're passionate. You got more time to let go of later. Um, so um, Winston, your overview. Can, I, um, can you hear me, Winston? Yes, we can, hear you. we can hear you. Right. Um, what happened is like, things don't just start just so, you know, um, it, it's like a long process, right? And a lot of things that we've been sweeping on the carpet has now come to fall, right? One of the things that we should have do ever since is we should have talked about slavery, the cause and the effect of 400 years. But what happened is now we never did that, you know what I mean? And we come now and we swallow another man culture. And if you see it now, to me, it reversed. We are by that we was the cool people and, you know what I mean? We know so take care of your family and make sure that everything all right. Father will go and work, pay the come home, bring home, mom will pay the bills, pay and maintain, run the house, rear the children, you know, but we get to a stage where that we tell yourself, all right, a material, give the children material and that will do everything. But in giving the children material, we forget to teach them respect too. So for them to learn respect, there was learning respect from the TV and from the radio because the man, a lot of the men get kicked out of the house, you know what I mean, for some reason, whereby that 
a lot of the women you know is doing the jobs that men are supposed to do. You know what I mean? We was taught this here too by other cultures that you just get children and go on and left them and you know what I mean? So the women from one from one father to look for help for the children to get another one, another one like that there. And you see it was always a cycle of bad parenting. And along with bad parenting, you get bad attitudes too. You understand what I mean? So the home was totally broken up. So they know the children went to the schools now. And when they went to the school, they see a certain amount of division too. Called you, do you do eleven plus? Yeah, in this country, you know, what I mean that is a part of segregation too. Because what's happening is in the eleven plus, you send all the children that learn into one place and sell all the rest that don't learn to another place. Whereby you know that you, you creating some academics and you creating some children that don't not, don't know nothing neither. And then with these same children that don't not doing learn nothing, you send them out here at 15 and 16, right? When they're trouble and they don't know what they're doing or nothing. But what I'm saying is, if you send a child out here and you don't got no um accreditation or no practical skills, what you send them out here to do, you understand what I mean? You send them here to be rejected. You understand what I mean? Because at the end of the day, when you do that to a child, you send a child out here. They ain't armed with nothing. You ain't got no soil accreditation on the practical skills. Right now, you're doing construction, and they, a lot of these little fellas out here were glad them for them to come and work with me. They can't even give me a good shovel full of sand. You understand me? For them want to talk with the reader, TF, or to come and help. You know, do carpentry or mason, plumbing, electrical, nothing like that. You understand what I mean? And I think that it was supposed to be mandatory for them to go and learn a practical skill, even if they ain't good with the writing and thing, to win them is 18 plus, and then they're good enough, then they can come out here on the street. But right now you can't send them out here at 15 and 16 to come on the street out here. Cause it hard, and you, we glorify material things. So when we send the children out here, and all the children can learn for material things, the same way too, it don't mean a love, it don't mean a peace, no nothing. So you send them, the only space that can come on lame is on these blocks. And from these blocks, you, you put in a set of people together that have no respect for the one another, nor themselves. You understand what I'm saying? So we got to look at the cause and effect of what really put this thing to happen. You understand what I mean? And they know they got stages of what we, do we get to this stage now. I can remember a time it was like guns out, where you were at a party and we see men come and take out guns and lime and thing. Where was the police? You understand what I mean? Where was the community leaders to come and talk about these things? So now it get to another stage, you know, that going past that, yeah, it's really men using the guns now. You understand what I mean? So crime, violence, hate, and everything come full for now. You understand what I mean? It, in the ghettos, so a lot of people tell themselves it ain't affect them. You understand what I mean? But it's just a matter of time before it, full escalation come. Then what am I going to do? So this is what you always ask in all your time. I relate like mothers, I relate like fathers, I relate like children. These same men, that at least get them a kind word and tell them I can. Let me sit and we talk and see what we could do. Because if you leave them like that, there's only three things that can happen. Your hospital, the cemetery, and the jail. Right? And in everything, they're going to be mourning. But a mother can mourn for a child that day. She can mourn for one in the hospital and she can mourn for one that in the jails. You understand what I mean? And then this thing has been glorified so much by the DJs that playing the music. You understand what I mean? Hollywood, that showing more graphic ways how to kill and how to murder and all these kind of things. You understand what I mean? So it got the people to feel now that what they are doing is right. But at the end of the day, we're in a man daddy day. We in the hospital. He, 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 he incapacitated in some way. Right? And when he in prison, he just wastes in life. You understand what I mean? Because if a man gets prison at between 18 and 20 somebody years to do 40 years to come back over here. We come back over here to do. You understand what I'm saying? There's nothing for you to do when you come back over here. So all you could do is preach the same thing because this is things I went through already. I, I, I brought the law already and I went, I went to prison. And, and the talk in prison, 
homosexuality, crime, and violence. You understand what I mean? So my Yeah, Winston. Uh, th thank you very much. You've made some very important right. points that we could pick upon during the course of this discussion. But um, our sister Vernie Sobers has joined us. And uh, Ms. Sobers, uh, what we did at the beginning, we asked everyone or the panelists to you know, introduce themselves and their, their background briefly, probably about uh, since you can give us about uh, probably a minute of you know, basically your background, and uh, then you can give us an opening overview of the topic that is uh, that we have on the table uh, this evening. Sobers? Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Well, we can okay. hear you loud and clear. And you can see me as well, or is my video? Yeah, we can see you. We can okay, see you. Great. Um, so my name is Vernie Sobers. I am a criminologist with forensic psychology. And um, I, sorry about that. And I, you said a, a brief background and I have, um, I'm also a mental health advocate. Um, I do work with PAHO as well as the Ministry of Health and Wellness. Um, and right now um, I'm wearing my roti and whenever I give a talk, I put this on because it was a gift from the, um, Minister of Health in the Cook Islands. And I promised her that whenever I give talks, I would wear this. So here we are. Um, in terms of, well, you know, I would have come in late and I'm my most humble apologies um, for being this late. Um, so I really did miss a good set of stuff. Well, not a good set in the beginning. But in terms of the topic itself, um, I think that things that we don't take into account, I heard the gentleman speaking before me and I, I see that his name is Winston. Um, and Winston, I'm sorry that I came in so late, but I still want him to touch on something that you said Um but I hope that I am not, um, I hope that I'm not speaking out of context or out of turn. But you were mentioning, you know, the DJs glorifying, you know, particular music. Um, you were mentioning society itself. Um, you know, the things happening in in society um the what the young boys or young women what the young people themselves um find themselves interested in interested in but I, I and like I said I don't want to say that I'm speaking out of turn or out of context but the one thing that I didn't hear in the beginning is that you know this the reality is is that these are the things that are going on in their communities. So if it is that you do indeed want to tackle the things happening in your community, it means then that you would have to, you know, actually care about the things happening in your communities. And I find that that's what a lot of young people don't necessarily have. And I'm not just going to say young people, because the truth is, is that um, we don't ever stop learning. And that's the reality. We never stop learning. You can be 80 and learn something new. So what tends to happen is that we always mirror our society and we learn based um, on our social environments. So if it is that our social environments are broken, then unless there is some kind of intervention, then, and, you know, you're not going to have a change in behavior. So the DJs glorifying music are the DJs playing the music about what's going on in the streets. 
And I mean, you know, the young people, <laughs> they are in the street. So they're, they're, they're paying attention and, um, you know, doing stuff based on what is happening in the streets. And then if it is that the older persons in society don't show the behavior that they want the younger persons to mirror, then it's going to be a vicious cycle. It's going to be a constant cycle. And, you know, it, it's then how do we actually go about breaking this cycle? And those are the things that we don't think about. We always talk about, you know, oh, but the government got to do this and all oh, the schools got to do this. And we don't realize that it's something as simple that can start in our own home based on just, you know, simple respect and paying each other respect. And that kind of stuff. So like I said, I don't want to talk about the turn. Um, I just wanted to to touch base on that. Because I I worked at the prison myself. I was there for four years, four and a half years. And the truth is, is that the prison opened up my eyes. I was a counselor at the prison. It opened up my eyes to a lot of things because I myself grew up fairly sheltered. I myself, I want to say sheltered, but, you know, I, I church every Sunday. Um, yes, I still used to go with my friends and party and all that kind of stuff. But in terms of the things that were going on in the streets, I can, I, that's when I found out about everything while it was at the prison. And that's when you also realize that you know, these are young men and young women who don't know how to use their words, who don't know how to talk, who don't know how to respond to anything but shout language and aggression because that is something that they have grown up in. That's something that they have continuously been um, a part of all of their lives. So maybe we should start thinking about starting at home and what can we do with in the home um i don't know if there's anything else right now i want to open up the floor and let the others talk i know i was late but still i still want to be able to catch in and um on what other people are saying as well so that if they do have any questions for me um, that I can answer as well as if you have any questions yourself, Emmanuel, that I can answer. Yeah, we, we thank you so much for your contribution. So um, I just want to put the audience on notice that we'll be coming to you um, in due course. So I hope you have all your questions ready or your brief comments. So there are a number of things that were said by each panelist, and I wanted to I want to open it the, the floor, so to speak, to each panelist to respond. If you've heard something that you need to respond to, that you agree with or disagree with, or that you want to add to or bring a broader perspective to. So I want to start, get back to um, Deputy Commissioner Boyce. And so you can have your say on what has been said so far that can take us forward in this discussion. All right, thank you again, uh, moderator. I have taken note of the passion, the passionate delivery of husbands. And uh, I remember in his in his uh, opening statement, he said he, he is not a believer of in statistics. Uh, well, from where I say in the Barbados Police Service, uh, much of our decisions not only are based on statistics, our strategies are concentrated around identifying the areas of concern based on what is reported to us. And as I say, you mentioned initially the crime wave, and I'm suggesting to you that because our stats 
it's shown a 6% decrease. And this decrease has been consistent for the past, past six months or whatever. Uh, and because uh, I, I, I'm suggesting to you that apart from murders or homicides, however you want to view it, the, 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 the other tenets of crime uh, of kind of maintain a decreased trend in, in the last six months or so. Yes, what has concerned the Barbados Police Service is the level of violence in the criminal activity. And I think that that is, is where the gap widened in terms of understanding what we are facing. Uh, we are not facing a crime wave. We are facing uh, an increase in violence and criminal activities. If, if in, in the analysis uh, you wish to say crime is crime, violence is violence, which I don't necessarily agree because I think that violence has an association with the criminal behavior. And if you go in that direction, trying to segment violence and crime, then I, I can see where we can have uh, challenges in our discussion. But what I want to say, yes, it is the impact of violence within the context of the criminal behavior that has sparked the, 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 the fear of crime within the context of uh, the Barbadian society. I, would advance that yes, there, there was violence in society from time immemorial, but because of one, the and I, I, I agree with uh, panelists uh, Eastern, one because you know there is no transitioning into into uh, the level of violence with the use of firearm and able firearms. Uh, it has given a different complexion to that level of violence. And it, from a, a, a police perspective, we are seeing where uh, there's availability of firearms and there's accessibility of firearms. And what worries us most is that the firearm is reaching the, the, the young adults that they're reaching the young adults and they seem to have the, the access to these quite easily. So from, from the Barbados police perspective, I am saying yes, no crime wave. What we, are, what we are experiencing is an increase in the understanding of violence associated with some criminal behavior, especially criminal behavior that involves firearms. And, and you would, you you'd ask me why I go in that direction, because a fist to fist can result in death. A uh, 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 blow on the head can result in death. But, it, we, but when we have that, that kind of uh, exchanges, it requires a, a, a very, you, you're going to not social distance, you're going to intimate distance. And I, I'm, I'm suggesting now, but because the firearm allows you to shoot from a distance, it, it, it gives a different complexion of the level of violence that is, is related to, to uh, that kind of crime, that kind of serious crime. So one, how, how do we tackle it from where we, where we say as police officers, we recognize that there's a need to get more information, operate our, our responses, our strategies on intelligence base, work with the NGOs, work with government entities, uh, uh, establish a strong presence in the neighborhood, uh, try to, to, to create divergence, divergentary uh, practices within the context of a, of a, of a dense society, a dense densely populated society and, and, and work in collaboration with the wider community, the church. So we, we see that as, and, and with parents, I must say, we see that as necessary in terms of shaping 
uh, a new thinking on one, the elimination and annihilation of violence within our, within our criminal landscape. Yes, thank you so much. And before we get on the other panelists and then the audience, I want to ask you, the police service is known as a reactionary force uh, service. Um, how much attention now is being placed on proactive, uh, so to speak, preventative in, in, in dealing with this because you now you have to go in that direction. I, I would suggest, moderator, that uh, again, I am not totally agreeing with you that we are reaction. We are not a fire brigade department. We are a department that studies uh, behavior in society and create responses that would allow for proactive or preventative sort of policing. Our mandate within the context of chapter 167 speaks to maintaining law and order, preservation of the peace, uh, protection of life and property, and, and detection of, of crime. Now, I've been with the system a considerable amount of time, and, and, and I, I, can, I can bear witness that the organization is forward thinking in terms of creating proactive programs. Uh, and, and these are things that have not happened yesterday. These are things that were happening time and time before. We, we do not wait until we are proactive, we create uh, preventative strategies. Uh, and, and so I, I, I can't agree with you that we are reactive. In, 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 and, and I don't have no evidence to support that we are reactive. Yes, we react to things based on the fact that matters are reported to us and we must respond. But outside of that, there are responses that are calculated based on, on our understanding of problems within society, our understanding of treating to issues that are creating ill health in communities. Uh, so you will have programs like the DARE programs, the juvenile liaison scheme, the, the, the uh, community officer program. So there's a whole series of programs. We do uh, crime prevention tips. All those are, are programs designed to, to create an awareness, create proactivity within the context of our, our society. So if you had in real terms to say what the crimes that have taken place vis-a-vis -vis what you have prevented by proactive strategy, how would you rank that, that ratio? Obviously we cannot be everywhere, every place at every time. And we are dealing with human behavior. And human behavior is multifaceted, it's complex. And, and what we in the organization have done over the years is not create a one fit for every, for, for whole of Barbados policing. We look at community by community, we look at public by public, and we respond, we create programs to treat to issues or problems within the respective uh, the respective areas. So to answer your question, I, I, I could probably quote a lot of uh, proactive responses. And, and I mentioned the juvenile liaison scheme. I mentioned the community uh, policing uh, apparatus. I mentioned also uh, the whole question of, let's say the school liaison. Uh, all those are programs geared at creating a, a proactive or changing behaviors or causing people to think on the other side of the coin in, 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 in understanding the problems or treating to the problems of Barbados. And so, yes, there are programs out there. We have programs out there that are proactive in nature and that 
creates these strategies for uh, making Barbados a safer place. All right, um, Aiston, do you want to respond yes. in any way? Yeah. Um, one of the things I would like to tell Mr. Boyce is, is um, the, we had a, a program going on in the schools, which are called DEAR, where the police used to adopt the schools and go and, especially live primary schools and things, and challenge the little children not to lose drugs, not to get involved with crime and things like that. I see some, somehow I see it, they can disappear. You know, and he wonder if it's something that he could do to get it back in full um, thing again. And to get the police get involved because we, we got um, the, the, the Prime Minister has put someone in charge of crime and they're doing a the job but they can't do it full force and one of the reasons why they can't do it full force is because love is not only hugs and kisses love is serious decisions where we know that because we love each other but things we just have to discipline them too so i would like to see the police involved with this same thing that um the person in charge of crime is doing whereby all right, you're holding all sorts of things, football, cricket, all these kind of things, and trying to keep the peace and thing. But you got to identify areas because one thing with Barbados, you see, you will see a time will come that it, it might be Chapman Lane giving trouble, then maybe the audience and thing. But one of the things that's happening is keep catching on all the time and going to different neighborhoods. So these are things that we got to keep looking at all the time. You understand what I mean? And try to shut them down before they get full scale. So we just can't go and keep football and cricket and all these kind of things. We got to identify when things start to flare. And even if it comes to a stage that it got shut down that area, it got to get shut down because at the end of the day, it is a society that we live in. You understand what I mean? And we can't let, we can't let as much as we might go do certain things in get us to survive. We can't let it go to the stage where that is out of control, is totally out of control. Because at the end of the day, if I tell people all the time, right? If I go through between the police and these same men that should be in the place, I think I go, I go choose the police because from my learned experience with these kind of things, the police is convinced something has happened or, or if it is reported, these men would want to do your all so then only even talking out your mouth. You understand what I mean? So I can't choose them. So in dealing with trying to get everything finished, you must involve the police too. And one of the things that I would like to see the police doing is to be a little bit more communicative with the people. Don't just come drive through these ghettos and got the gun nozzle through the window and you know what I mean? That's fair. Right, but at the end of the day, how are we supposed to communicate if you are coming to show fear? Because we didn't even fear the ghetto already, and if the peacekeepers come now, which, and as I say, love is a, a serious decision too. So it got to be a matter, it got to be a um, thing of fear too. But in at the mean, in the meantime, you got to interact. Because sometimes they'll be saying, "Now we see that police will pass, and very few will say, all right, all right, fellas." But I don't mean that because them so art fellas that them got to go and lend a strong hand or strong word to mingle and do it. So these are the kind of things that we got to do. You understand what I mean? You try to bring back peace and thing to the ghettos. Yeah, thank and you. The last thing that I would like to touch upon is advantage. I would like big men, big men to stop taking advantage of people's children, especially the ones that I don't want to them as fools, but the ones that are a little bit slow. Because me, you and I know the F a little bit slow and the small read is still slow. So if you give a gun, it's still slow again. So don't take advantage of people children. You understand what I mean? Because this is what bring this thing full scale and out of hand too. Because 
some of these people that ain't really ain't, ain't really got the common sense. Got a lot of these, they got people out here right now. I don't know the main trouble with the people. I mean, there's something wrong with them. But when we hear these things, they're laughing and scaring out the telling us normal. You know? Thank you so much. I send, I see Bernie has her hands up. Um, and from here on in, I would like your responses or your comments to be as concise as possible because we want to get to the audience. I'm just telling you, I'm coming out of not going to let you drink on my mind shop here and then go along with the rest when I said. All right, I yield the floor now and let somebody else speak. Yeah, yeah, thank you. So, like I was saying, from here on in, I would like us to be as concise as possible so that we can get to the audience. So, and, um, because we need to put this, you know, have this done in, in a particular order so that we can have the audience and then we will have your closing remarks. So all that counts for time. So, um, Sorbers? Hi. So uh, what I want to say is two-pronged. Two-pronged in that um, Mr. Boyce, no, let's start with um, Mr. Joseph made a statement, which is which is quite funny that you said it that way um, about the force being reactionary as opposed to pro, pro, proactionary. And Mr. Boyce replied to that and said, you know, I wouldn't say that that's what we are. We don't, you, 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 you use the phrase, we're not a fire brigade. We don't come after. But Eisten said exactly what I was going to say, but I'm going to add some more to it. So if it is that you're only seeing the police after the fact, that makes it reactionary. If it is that you're not communicating with the society as you should, that makes it reactionary. Now, I always get hammered on by the police because they always say I don't give them a fair chance, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I really believe that sometimes I do and sometimes I don't. But in this case, understanding that one thing I left out as well was that I was a lecturer in criminology, sociology, and psychology at UWA for eight years. Um, right, sorry about that. I was a lecturer in, I've, I've written papers, I've written excerpts, I've attended conferences. I have saw, you know, all these things. And what what's the, what's the one thing that you hear when you go back into the street will be men? them come at we so we gonna come at them i remember a year i took my students on a tour sorry you're gonna hear my daughter screaming she's having a bath sorry about that um i took my students to a tour of district a for police and society that's the name of the course police and society and they were asked um sorry one of my students asked the officer so, you know, what when us do, like, you know, when is God beat up people, when is beat up people, and thing? And um, the gentleman said, no, no, we, we use something called tact. No, I don't know if everyone here knows the definition of tact. And I can't say that even though we have a, a, a society that has a alleged literacy rate of 98%, which is one of the top literacy rates in Latin America and the Caribbean, making it also top 10 in the world. You don't see tact when they're on the road. They see, so the community is going to respond based on what they see. They're going to respond based on what they hear. They're going to respond based on the lack of communication. So the whole talk is about how do we tackle violent crime? You mentioned that we're not having a crime wave. But the statistics would say otherwise. You, you know, violent crime 
you know, violence and crime go hand in hand. You can't have violence and not have crime. Yes, you can have a crime that doesn't isn't a violent crime, but you can't have violence that and not have a crime. So we do know that they go hand in hand. But I think that what we all tend to look at is we're we're looking at this increasing the police presence in the community may not necessarily be like I, I we we're talking about citizen security, yes. And we need to make sure our citizens feel safe, yes. But then if it is that you are doing the patrols and like Eisen says, you just seeing these men in these big black jeeps rolling through your neighborhood with guns through windows, that's that's fair. And that's instilling fear. And you don't want a society who has to live in fear of two things. The persons in their society because of violent crime and then the persons who are charged to protect their society. So I think that when we talk about these things, we also have to look at, yeah, you guys are doing, you're doing, a, you're doing an, an okay job. I'm not going to say you guys are doing a great job. I'm going to say you guys are doing an okay job. You're doing an okay, but yes. It does seem very reactionary when the only time we hear the police or see the police is after the fact. So then that's something that you guys have to work on. You have to work on that communication with society. Not everyone has social media, but the got royal or people that listen to brass tacks every day. Not everybody reads a paper because not everybody in Barbados can read. But there are also other methods. They get on the bus. You can put up, you know, panels. There are lots of other ways because when we talk about the violent crime that we're having now, we just aren't talking about guns. We're also talking about the increased number of stabbings. And like I mentioned a, a, a while back, you have to look at that from a psychological aspect because no, we keep looking at everything from a criminological aspect. Let's look at the psychology of it now. Because looking at it from a criminal perspective isn't working. So let's look at it from a psychology note. What's going on in their minds? What's happening? The amount of fights they're having, you know, all of these things, that's also violent crime. So it's not just about po, po, po and guns. It's also about stabbings. It's about beatings. It's about big rocks. It's about breaking bottles and stabbing somebody. Is you know, all of these things. So... Those are the other things that we, we also have to consider and talk about. Yes, you know? that's great. Thank you so much. Um, uh, let's move on to, um, have I heard uh, Roger in a while? So Roger, could you try to be as concise and in your response? You've heard a lot, I'm sure. And I know you have something to say. So we can advance this, this discussion. Uh, it's okay. We can probably move on to because pretty much everything was said. Uh, I still don't believe in statistics. I believe that everything has its subject to error. Um, and that's why I have a problem with statistics because I believe that at some points in time there are errors. There's certain people who are interviewed for these things. Uh, certain thing. I, I, it's just my philosophy. Everything has its error. Uh, continue what I talked about. I said that the other thing that I, I mentioned, the bill app being changed, which I appreciate. Um, I, I talked about the family, the parents being responsible now for this issue. And I also want to talk about the church responsibility uh, and the fact that the church has the buildings and the infrastructure to help us to deal with some of these problems. And uh, I'm about to launch something within the churches and I'm hoping they can get the bishops um, um, back in uh, because we need to now utilize the churches now as a form of assisting some of these issues. We should have counselors at every church. There should be a counselor in every district. Every every um, community should have a counselor and the church has the facilities. It has the building, it has the structure. There should be youth groups meeting every Saturday morning, young people in the community that come to the church on Saturday. They're not for church service. We, we don't want to deal with the church service at this time, but we're saying a church service where they can come and get some uh, psychosocial education, some different other social skills that they can learn at these such at these group activities. So we are looking at these things as solutions to the problems. I want to also say quickly, I know that it comes to my head, is that I believe that the police is doing a fantastic job. That's the first thing. Uh, the only way, again, we can 
uh, help and assist this problem. And I want to not say that police is doing okay job. I want to say police is doing a fantastic job in the sense that sometimes the, 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 the kind of things that they have to go through is not an easy process with people who don't want to say what is going on or what is happening in the community. And I think, um, as it was said earlier, if the, the relationship between police and community could be better, fine. I don't even know if that will help because we have indoctrinated our society to understand that if you snitch, you get in trouble, you'll get stitches. So people prefer to keep their mouth closed rather than open their mouth. I think there's an issue where, um, where, where people see things that happen. There's a, there's a, there's a Crime Stopper hotline, and those who don't know what the Crime Stoppers hotline is, is a, a, a very accessible line that you can call into anonymously and get the information shared with police so that they can go and do their job. So if police plus the community work together, we will have this problem. Uh, at least we will have the problems, but we also need to look at some solutions. And I believe that those are the solutions that I bring to the table. And I'm hoping that the church will back the program so that at the end of the day, we can utilize the churches across the, the community, the country to help solve some of this problem. Thank you so much, Roger. So um, I just want to put the audience on notice that we're coming at you very, very shortly. So um, what we want to do is to go to Deputy Commissioner Boyce. You have heard uh, what the comments were with respect to the police and what you said. So I want to give you an opportunity to respond before we get to the audience. No, I, do, I do appreciate the fact that, you know, there are different views of the other views that can inform or thinking within the Barbados Police Service. I am always one who embrace the view and uh, whether or not the view is one that is uh, destructive in terms of the morale of the organization. Uh, we do appreciate the fact that you have a voice and that you can actually make a contribution to the way you're neighborhood or your country is being police. I am again uh, re-emphasizing, okay, I, I, in our planning, in our response to, to criminal activity or to police in Barbados, let me say police in Barbados, because uh, there's a level of violence too in road policing. Uh, and I agree that there are instances, and I agree with Einstein to the effect that, you know, we need to demonstrate tough loving. Uh, uh, you know, we need to, in, in, in a way, be assertive, but be assertive for the good. So, we, and I know that my organization is, is poised in terms of administering tough love, correcting behaviors, making people think differently. The other thing that, that I want to raise too is, one thing we in the organization, we recognize that there are small forces that display the grips. Now, by overlooking some small issues, and, and, and that from a community, from an individual, and even from time to time from our, our policing uh, uh, understanding, there's some small forces that, that we allow to to, to grow into the adult. And as a result of that, we, we are confronted with, with you know, spy grips or spy fields or whatever. Uh, so yes, people argue that zero tolerance is not always the best answer, but within the context of correcting behavior within society, we have to establish fairness. We have to demonstrate that, um, you know, that, there are little small things that can grow into big things that can even grow into things and, 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 and bear fruit. And, and sometimes we wonder in our planning meetings that whether or not by allowing the forces to, to the small forces to run, have we not begun to create a criminal class within the, 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 the sociology of structures? Have we not begun to, to create that criminal class that would look at, at generational, uh, generational developments and, and, and consider you know, socio, socioeconomic issues 
as driving force for being in the position that they are in and don't want to move from that position. So it is, it is those situations. And another thing that in my years as an investigator, and in, um, perhaps more in recent times, in the last 10, 15 years or so, there's this word called disrespect. Disrespect. And it's a word that I, I, I try to get the context when, when people are dealing, especially with serious violent matter, what, and, and some trivial, trivial responses that people say, you disrespect me. I look at you too hard, or I say something, you go away saying, I disrespect. I am being disrespected, so therefore you should, you, you, there should be an, a, a, a remedy for that level of disrespect. And then we have, and again, from my own personal experience as an investigator, there's something called, call your mother. Call my mother. You know, so I tend to think that mothers have the answers to correcting the behaviors of many of the young men. You, you, you hardly find a person saying, call my father. He's called my mother. And you know what, the mother, when, when she get to the police station or she get, you know, within the context and the confines of the police, what she asks, they beat you? What they do to you? She don't ask about the criminal behavior. She don't ask about why you are here. All she wants to know, they beat you? Or why, you know, they unfair you? So I believe that mothers have that influence on the behaviors of especially young men. And I, I, I think that they need to pay some attention to, to, to making sure that the behaviors or the messages that they sent out is, is the message that bring a person in line with what society is requiring. As to communication, yes, uh, the patrolling methods, uh, there are approaches to policing that, you know, everybody know universal. Universally, there's crackdowns, there's stop and search, there's uh, uh, searches. They, they, those are behaviors to demonstrate enforcement. Enforcement. And I, and I, I agree again that, yes, uh, sometimes our units would pass and, you know, don't get engaged. But sometimes that is conditioned by the environment. <laughs> the environment in which, whereas you need to, to, to create a tough love, assertive approach to, to, to managing particular environments. So I think I'm going to stop there for the time being. Thank you so much. So it's now about what? Just about uh, nearly 10 minutes after it. So it's, the floor is now open for the audience to ask their questions. And please uh, keep your questions concise. And if you have to make a comment, keep the comments concise. And think about what you have to say before you say. It. And um, so the audience can respond and we can get as much as many people in as possible. So who will be first? If there's a long lapse, I will move on to the panel, so. Greetings. Greetings. I'm listening to you from Jamaica. Oh, great. Welcome. I, and uh, you would have to leave here to understand the magnitude of our problem. So I, I don't think you have reached our stage yet. So we are praying for you that you never get to our point where it's entrenched. Yes, thank um, you. We don't say... We don't say snitches get stitches. We say informer for dead. That's how serious we are about it. Have a good program. Thank you. Thank you for that kernel, that kernel of thought. And um, I think we are aware that we really don't want to get to that stage where Jamaica is at. So we need to do what we need to do right now. Any others from the audience? Hi, good evening, Emmanuel. Good evening, Harlem. Harlem Booker. Uh, two quick questions. Uh, I'd be happy if Commissioner Boyce, sorry, Deputy Commissioner Boyce, sorry to promote you so quickly. Um, could, could you explain exactly in simple language what you mean by creating a tough love uh, environment? And the other thing is, 
Um, I'd be interested in hearing some discussion about the issue of education reform. Um, we have, I know the figures out there showing that a lot of students are coming out of school and they can't read or write, you know, and the link has been made, I think I see made the link to, um, you know, basically students who are illiterate, they don't have skills and crime. So um, I don't know if anybody wants to step on that link between what, what you need to do in terms of solutions, in terms of education and literacy, basically working on the basic things of literacy, you know, to, um, to get people functional. Uh, thanks a lot, Manuel. Boys? Yeah, I, I think basically when, when I speak to Tough Love, I'm speaking to the enforcement of laws. Uh, and sometimes the enforcement of laws can take people away from situations. And perhaps, you know, they end up in, in, a, in a jail or prison or as the case may be. And it is not because... Uh, we want that for you in the long run. It is because we recognize that you, we need to pull you away from society. We need to 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 make sure that that the persons around you are are as safe as they can be. And in so doing, you, we have to deprive you of, let's say, uh, of that particular privilege or that that right to to to. To, to freedom, so to speak. So I'm, I met from the enforcement perspective in, in, in relation to the applications of the various uh, pieces of legislation. Okay. That answers your question, Hala? Yes, it does. But, and the, but the other thing is this link between the fact that we're churning out more and more students uh, at a primary and secondary school level who cannot read and write and they, they don't have the skills and, and I mean, what is the solution to that, you know, that, that, that education issue, which is linked to crime, it's been linked to crime. If they don't have skills to do, do to be productive, if they don't, they can't read and write, I mean, where, where do they go but look at, a, a, you know, some sort of uh, element of crime to, to pay the bills and, and meet, meet needs. Yeah. I think I want to tackle that. Right, hold on. Okay. Yeah. Um, then, um, okay. Go ahead, um, Sobers. Uh, so, but yeah. well, after you speak, I have someone out of Jamaica again. So I will give them that opportunity as, as soon as you are finished. That's absolutely no problem. Um, I think that what tends to happen in our island is because we have no natural resources, our people are our resources, and we push education, and we push streamline education, we push mainstream education, and we don't encourage our children necessarily to learn a trade. And that's something, in all honesty, that has been passed on generationally from slavery until now. Um, you know, we want our children to go to school, but we're not necessarily bothered to a certain extent as to what, how they are performing in school. And the thing about it is, is that because we also place so much emphasis on what school people go to, you know, we don't take into consideration that they're, you know, learning happens differently. There are some people who don't learn in certain environments, et cetera. Um, so I think that what we're going to need to have to do um, in terms of, and, and I, Com Deputy Commissioner Boyce won't be able to, like, I, he won't be able to ask because he's a working education sector. Um, none of us, you know, in that sense. But I think that, you know, in terms of being able to, you know, get them interested and into trades that will actually, you know, make them you know give them enough um money that they can or, or if you understand what i mean in terms of you know pushing a trade i know that mr husbands has his um his um his I, i'm not going to call it a school well a school um yeah of sorts where he does his he called it a second chance where he does the lessons and they they teach you know all of those things there which is really great 
Um, and then there are other, you know, institutes, but then also it is, you know, the fact that we actually have to, as a society, come to understand that having a physical degree isn't, you know, it's not always about having 10 CXEs because, you know, it, it also is about what what can you do? I know a man that wants a tiling do. You could tell. You want to go and learn to tell. You want to go and learn a trade because, you know, and that's what we have to do. We have to start completely encouraging our young people. And even from small, you you could, if if you see a, a, a six-year-old tell a grandmother that they want to be a grave digger, the grandmother can be the most upset, but grave diggers has meant real good money. And she can be upset because she wants him to go to school to learn something but not necessarily understanding that that first that that first um set of schooling is also leading him or could lead him to a trade that would also help and i think that those are the things that we need to consider when we think about educational reform and how we are going to use educational reform um to tackle crime yeah. within society thank you so much uh, we have Nardia Nesbeth, I hope I um, pronounced that name correctly, out of Jamaica. Come in. Good evening, everyone. Evening. Uh, well, all protocols um, observed. Greetings from our district heads. Um, sister, is it Verne? I'm hoping I'm pronouncing it right. Um, Verne. Verne. She touched on a lot of things that I wanted to speak about because as my fellow Jamaican would have spoken about, you know, in Jamaica, we have a high crime rate. We have it challenging here. But in terms of tackling, for one, the culture of not speaking about what you see, I found or I, I think that it can be tackled from the basic school level. Because in terms of changing people's mindset, we, we in Jamaica, sometimes we say, you know, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. And so you, you probably want to tackle the younger minds who are not yet exposed to certain things and to teach them the value of, te of looking out for each other, basically, and the value of respecting, respecting you know, each other in terms of ensuring that if you see something, you speak out about it before it gets to a point where you need serious intervention. And if they are able to understand the importance of each other's lives and each other's um, ability to, come to, to give to society, then I think that you will be able to slowly change the mindset because you have to look at it from a futuristic standpoint. We already have people who are at the point where they have accepted certain things, they have accepted crime and violence as it is, and they see no hope for change. And so the focus cannot be solely on them, but toward the younger generation coming up. And I also wanted to point out also the possibility of looking at mentorship. I heard someone speak about talking to the youth on a Saturday morning, but again, going back to the younger generation and pulling them into groups of specified mentorship that would show them how important it is. Because as Sister Vernia said, some persons do not learn the same way as others. There are some persons who are going to get 15 CXCs and some who are not going to get any, no matter how hard they try. But they are very good with their hands. Teach them the value of becoming innovators. Because something that I've recognized the other day is that the Asian population are teaching their children to be the innovators and to be the bosses. And it's as if the Caribbean islands, we are teaching our children to be consumers and, you know, dependent on those who are being taught to, to create. So we have to teach our children that what they are good at with their hands is also equally as important as the persons who can put forward 15 CXCs and come out academically on top. So that's what I wanted to add to the conversation. Well, don't go anywhere. Um, it's important that we have you here because I wanted to ask you, what can we learn from Jamaica's situation? Because Jamaica was evidently not always like it is today in terms of crime. What can we learn from the Jamaica story that can Pull us back, so to speak, from the precipice uh, of reaching the stage you are at. 
I think for for us, I I really believe that what's what started to happen is that persons felt disempowered to do something about the crime that they're seeing, and so until it reaches a stage where it's on your doorstep, for us in Jamaica, we turn a blind eye to everything that does not directly affect us. And so it's about teaching the younger generation how to love persons as how Christ would have wanted them to love. Because we have to ensure that they understand the love of Christ, that it goes for all and not just themselves. So it's it's more of a pulling persons away from I need to preserve myself only to looking at how I can preserve the lives of my neighbors and of my friends. And then that, I believe, will spiral and help persons to understand that as a country, we can stand together because there is strength in numbers. What do you think we are leaving out of this conversation whenever we talk about crime and violence? What do you think we are leaving out that is probably key or one of the key things that we need to talk about or apply? If uh, I may interject. Yeah, go uh, ahead, Connie. Yeah. In Jamaica's case, it was the influence of the politician. They are the ones who got it going. The, the, the battle for um, politics, for political power, um, divided the country into two camps. And it moved from throwing bottles and stones into using high-powered weapons. And of course, once the elections were over, those weapons were turned into other, to do other jobs, put it that way. And that's where you had extortion coming in. That's where you had scamming coming in. And that's where you had the whole matter of development of gangs. And if I can even go a generation further back, I think our problem really started from the migration to England in the 50s, when that set of children were left without parents. And that whole generation was raised by grandparents. I believe that's where our decline actually started. Thank you. Thank you so much. Do you want to add anything, Nardia, before we move on? No, I think he I think he covered it. I think he covered it. My response should have come after his response because I'm from a younger generation than he is. So they were portrayed it together. Right, right. The two marry, the two come together greatly. I really appreciate your invaluable contribution at this point in time. I think this was very germane to this discussion that we can learn from each other and uh, move forward for a better Barbados and a better Caribbean. Thank you so much. And if you, you know, you care, you can stick around. Thank you so much. And anyone else from the audience? Hi, good night. Good night. Hi, uh, thanks for having me. Uh, first, I want to say, Brother Emmanuel, this is an extremely wonderful program. All the panelists has came with some wonderful ideas, um, suggestions. What, what I would like to see happen is that there's a larger forum of this type of conversation where the, the general public, not just those now that are on Zoom, but general public can see and understand where our concerns lie. Um, in, in, and quickly, the one about students coming out not being able to read and write, only today we've had a conversation about St. George Secondary School, which turned out to be one of the worst schools Barbados ever produced. Today, St. George School is a school that is well sought after. Because instead of teaching academics alone, they're going in now to the skill training programs in a very large way, and students are seriously excelling. So these are things that we can look at, and I truly appreciate this program. So kudos to everyone. Thank you. To God be the glory. Anyone Amen. else? Anyone else? Okay. As we salute, I, I have second chance lessons and uh, only I'm, I'm, I'm very proud to say that uh, about two to three weeks ago, we started a class with young men. And, and Matt, Emmanuel, could I tell you that the classroom was full burst with young 
men. I'm not talking about young. Uh, there are no women, no girls were there at all. All young men. Uh, the oldest age there was about 30 something. And then they went to the, the 16s and the 14s and the 17s and the 18s and 19s of young people who had challenges with reading and writing. And Suki King's wife, Miss King, who should be definitely a local, uh, promoted and, and, and bigged up over this place, had the opportunity to interface with these young people. Um, yes, I understand, Emmanuel, that yes, we have skills programs up there that can help. But guess what? I have skilled teachers who are complaining that young men don't even know how to measure out the numbers and add and height and width and all these kinds of things that should be the basic learning in school. Uh, and so, so when we talk about still having them with the hands, we got to un also understand there are teachers across this nation that teach in skill classes that are uh, challenged with young people who cannot even know how to measure and what's width and length and all those kind of things that are basic to education. Uh, and so, so we have the distinct pleasure, and I'm, I'm very thankful to Miss King who had taken the opportunity to come and help us with these young people, eighteen year olds and nine years that cannot read and write, you know. But they have committed crime because nearly half of them are majority of them are from the court. Uh, and, 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 and they're sent to us due to the fact that the court is trying to say, well, look, I'm not going to send you to prison, but I want you to go and get some counseling and I want you to go and get some education. Now these the courts are asking us to educate them. So Miss King has the took and, and then there's a, the more teachers that's coming in, but Miss King is the one that leading it, and she is the one that uh, uh that's trying to help us to get that sorry. So in terms of that. Yeah, we, we need not only the academics, yes, we don't you need these high skill, but these um, young people need the basic education. If not, the skill is not going to work at all, at all, because they're going to be confused about what the measurements are, and then go they give people poor and bad service. So there needs to be some form of basic um, academic that needs to be placed in, in the school system, but also that they can still use the skills. Um, that will be. Thank you so much, Roger. And while I, while the audience is uh, making their contributions and between those points, um, anyone from the panel that has, uh, you know, something to add or something they forgot, they can jump in in between the audience as well. So to keep this moving. Um, Hello, um, please I send Mr. Roger. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Go um, ahead, Mr. Yes. Um, one thing quick that I would like to say, I would like the politicians, the merchants, the lending agencies, the bankers, and the church to know that poverty is the mother of crime and that whatever them could do to help these situations relating to do it, right? And we don't only just want loans to buy the cars because the cars only last for about 10 years and then the match we want loans to buy houses. The same way that we're not unleashing, right now they're unleashing another ethnic community, but we know that community with communities, they're opening all the shops, in every business that, and the truth okay, we can't get in we can't get to the banks and borrow the money, no name, right? But these same people is the principal land owners in these countries that would like them to start to make sure that the cut up some land even if to sell it for $5,000 for some little small lots and make sure that you will have affordable housing that can raise them children. You understand what I mean? Because if, if somebody can get a little piece of land for $5,000, then they can build a reasonable house on it. But if we take the land and sell it for three and $400,000, we create more and more poverty out there. And that's why a lot of these people can't get from these slum areas. And these slum areas is what is breeding crime drugs and all the things that one don't want to see in a, in a society, right? So I just want that the politicians and these other people come and do a better job of helping the poor too, but this is, this is the mother of all crimes. Thank you. So let me throw something to you, uh, a challenge to you. Um, a lot of the, or some of the, the groups that you refer to are, uh, they're united in their efforts. They join hands and they join their resources and they work together to make things happen. But who are the people who are, who are shooting each other? It's the same black people and the same people that you're talking about that, need, that you say are poor. They're the ones that are killing each other and uh, they're divided. Um, but I think that 
every person, yes, there are some people who definitely can't, you know, make ends meet and because of certain circumstances. But I think that a lot of us um, make too many excuses and instead of taking responsibility for our own future, uh, I think that that has to be said as well. So when you say A, you have to say B. And so that's my, uh, we have brother L Laborde. I hope I got that correctly. Yes. Yeah, brother Laborde. Yes. You can hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, good afternoon to each and everyone. I'm from St. Vincent, but right now I'm in the U.S. And okay, I, was given welcome. This, I was given this link and I had a prior uh, session but I came on a little bit late, so I might not have heard everything, but I did my best to pick up and to glean as much as possible. Right. So this it's is something I've been troubling yes. with for a long time. Okay. And I want to commend whoever it is that put this together. I just want to commend you because we cannot just sit by and do nothing because the same thing is going to repeat itself tomorrow and the next day and the next day. So we have to start somewhere. However, we have to be aware and conscious that we're dealing with a very complicated situation. Crime is very complicated. And we can sit here and point a finger to this and point a finger for that, but that would not satisfy or meet the requirement as to what is really causing crime. So therefore, what I am suggesting, and this is a start that you already done because I've seen the, the, the police was there and the, the criminalists was there and other people are there from different areas of our society. We have to get all the stakeholders involved in a comprehensive plan to address this crime situation. Let me give you, a, for example, if you're building a, a, a plumbing system and for one reason you didn't, take care of a nut at a certain place, water gonna come out. And then that could flow, overflow and destroy your building. So all the stakeholders, the parents, the teachers, the police, the government, the business owners, the church, civil organization, as my brother rightly said, we all have to take responsibility. We cannot make excuse and we have to come together and come with some plan and work together so that it would benefit the, the folks. Now we have some challenges that we are facing. First, you have to, how do you deal with social media? You have to come up with a plan to counteract the glamour, glamorization of crime, and et cetera, regarding social media. You have to deal with that. How do you deal with drugs? You have to come up with a plan to hit drugs straight on because that is messing up the, the, the minds of our young people and they are not accomplishing that which they ought to do or participating in the things that they should go. And for the church for making it available to establish what, what some sort of training program or whatever, or whoever group is doing it, that's a step in the right direction. But like I said, all the stakeholders have to come together and work together to deal with this problem. It's a serious problem and it's affecting all the islands that I know and all, I'm living in the United States. Crime is killing us over here. I'm, I'm now in Queens. Crime is terrible over here, but I have a home in St. Vincent as we are retiring and there's so much guns and I don't want to point hands or, or blame on anybody, but is there in any way that we could get to the source of some of these things? Because many times when you have a problem, you can't put a Band-Aid on it. You have to get to the source. And in getting to the source, you would really be able to take care of some things. Because the guys on the street, for example, who's pushing some drugs, he's not the one who's bringing in the drugs in the country. The person who have a gun, he's not the one who bring it, it through customs or however it came through. So we have to get to the source. We have to root out corruption in different areas of our lives. And people have to take responsibility, as the brother rightly said. Parents have to be responsible and held re responsible for the situation. So again, I, I want to applaud and commend you for making this right step in the right direction. And hopefully we together as a one community, one nation, one people could come together and take out 
Don't make kids feel it's cool to de do, do crimes. No, let's de let's destroy that ter terminology. De oh, this is cool. That no, it's not cool. You're destroying people's lives. And we can't make excuses. Oh, well, I didn't get a job, so I'm gonna shoot somebody to get some food. No. We have to have some sort of moral discipline and behavior and respect. And the church, I'm so glad the church is participating because we have to get that simple rule. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. And we have to expand on that and let people come to some common understanding as to what we're dealing with. I just want to say thank you for listening. Thank, thank you so much, brother. Wish you well. Um, uh, Sister Vernie, I will get to you shortly, but... Um, I want to get in as many people from the audience as possible. See if anyone else has anything to say or ask questions from the audience. Uh, yes, Brother Emmanuel. Yes, please, Pastor. Um, this is probably going to involve both Vernice and Roger. And it's building on what Winston has alluded to earlier, there are two, a number of things that are swirling through my mind, but I'm going to ask two, two questions. The first one relates to how we have indoctrinated ourselves that the only way forward or the best way forward is individual achievement rather than collective community achievement. I say that to, I, when I say that I mean, we have so exalted getting first or being at the top or being better than someone else that in the process we have caused whoever or allowed whoever is not first or at the top to feel that they have not achieved. How do we pull that back in a society, in a world where the individual, um, individual's contribution is magnified to such an extent that even if they are not in community, even if they're not a part of the community, they are still seen in many cases better than the contributions of a community. How do we pull that back? Because um, one would admit that 40 years ago, 50 years ago, perhaps even 30 years ago, it was a community effort for many things. It was a community effort to raise a child. It was a community effort to um, be a part of a birthday celebration. But in these days, it's, it's a group of individuals coming together to do things. And sometimes there is not much community. That's one aspect that I would like, I think Bernice is, in a better position to handle that. But the second one has to do with the education system that we've been complaining about. What does an, all, uh, what does an education system that caters to the various types of learning challenges that we have look like? And is that something we'll be able to afford to implement, because we can talk about changing the system, but if the system that we want to change to is too expensive, I think it's all going to be a lot to talk. So what it is we would like to see, and how do we see that playing out in terms of being able to address the issues of crime that we currently have? Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Winston, you want to tackle any of those two Two points, two questions first, or both? Yes, please. Um, well, some of the ways that we could handle this is, I see a lot of the community centers um, only opening up when it is the financial year, to open them and clean them, and then shut them back down. It's community centers and the pastors need to open up again, right, as they used to be before. And we need some people, some successful people that has now moved on in society to come and give you some pep talk, some lectures, you know what I mean, on how to do certain things, how to become business people. You understand what I mean? How, how we could approach different organizations to get help 
You understand? And then we need to have a community approach where everybody try to adopt, especially troubled children. And don't just curse them and tell them that they're not good. Tell them that they could be good and that there's a future over there for them. Only if they would just take time to listen, right? You, you just can't come and condemn a man and expect you to change, right? They got something that they must teach in jail. It's called a value education, and they must teach that last six months, six weeks here, or uh, whatever state they got. I think it's something that need to be taught in the schools, whereby that the children will get a chance to learn how to respect and to love one another again. Because as Mr. Boyce was saying, we got a problem with disrespect, right? But I ain't got no problem with disrespect. I have a problem with respect. We are by that. We must we must get to the stage where we, we respect our elders again. I see the young people don't like to interact with old people, like they tell us that old people miserable and they ain't got nothing to learn. But I still listen to the old people and the old people got a lot to teach and that they can learn from. So what we like is a community outreach for everyone. So all class, everywhere else, don't, don't just let me tell yourself that we're better than this body and we can't do this and we can't do the next thing. And some people can only take up garbage and clean gutters and things. Let me look at it like everybody on the same level and we, could, we, we should be able to approach everyone. And you see when we start to do these kind of things, all of the people that tell themselves that the bad them gonna got to fear though, or be a part of what's going on. Thanks. Thank you so much, Princeton and Bernie. Um, and so before you before you go, Bernie, um, <clears throat> we come around the home stretch, so mm -hmm. um, I'll make it quick. Uh, you will be, and uh, then if there's any one other person from the audience that want to make a contribution. If they don't, then we will have the closing uh, remarks by each panelist. Go ahead. Right. So, um, I I think it's it's you. The question was about how do we um get away from the idea of 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 the individual only, and I think that that's hard because um we have literally stripped accountability away from ourselves. Um, where now we blame everyone else for things um, as opposed to accepting the wrongs that we have done and then, you know, looking to atone for those wrongs. So, you know, while, like you said, once upon a time it was a village, now, you know, we don't encourage the village mentality anymore because persons get upset when you tell them how they should live, where they should live, why in the ways which they should live, as opposed to seeing it as, you know what, I might just actually be looking out for your best interest. And I think that the, the main way that we can actually get back to a community level of things is understanding the, that there's camaraderie in community. And if it, you know, if you're asking the church to do something, no, let me just throw in, um, you know, I, I grew up in the Anglican church right around the corner from you guys. I, I um, Christ the King is my, um, you know, family church at our parish church. And, you know, I can say the same thing where, you know, growing up, you saw them, we, we believed in community and going into Eden Lodge and even going into Cave Hill and, you know, doing all those things. And we saw that, we had that, we felt that. But then as persons get older, um, they tend to not, they, they, they don't feel the same warmth from the church that they did before. Um, and that is because they think that those persons in the community um, will look down on them and cry down on them. So therefore, it, everything is for self. Um, so I think along with that, and you did ask also, Pastor, about um, how do we tackle the differing learning environments? 
Um, I see the Ministry of Health, sorry, the Ministry of Education is truly trying to, um, in terms of free education, uh, help in understanding that obviously help in, in with, with students who don't learn in particular ways. But unfortunately, I find in Barbados, um, you get through when you have money, when you could pay for it. You know, you'll find that privately. You'll find the best top notch, you know, um, um, non-streamline or non-mainstream schools being private. Um, and, you know, that's why those persons that can afford to send their children there um, are the ones that scrunt all they can, all they, all they can to send their children there, you know, that kind of thing. But, you know, the Ministry of Education, I do see them putting in some good effort um, in realizing that, you know, we can't all put 20-something children in one classroom and expect the same result from all 20-something children. Um, so, you know, and, and that being a precursor to violent crime isn't necessarily, um, you know, uh, a, a guarantee, to be honest. But we do have to go back to the sense of community. We have to go back to the sense of, I have your back if you have money. And I think that's what a lot of people lost out of and lost out on. And, you know, in terms of losing losing hope in the church, losing faith in the church, because then they're not seeing the church as having their backs. You know, you mentioned in a comment, speaking with the youth, they would like to be loved because they said, um, you know, Emmanuel asked, what are we missing? And they said, the voices of the youth. We always speak for them and not with them. And you responded, speaking with the youth, they would like to be loved, accepted, and nurtured for who they are, not what we want them to be and because you know especially in the church and in the older generation we always want to tell them this is what you are supposed to be but we don't ever accept them for who they are and work with them on that level and I think you know that's something that we have to start to work on in terms of um, getting back to community and and um the village, the idea of the village, because no lie, the village really, really is where the strength lies. So, yeah. So I will probably take that as your part in shots, so to speak, and no pun intended here. Um, so let's go on to Deputy Commissioner Boyce to give your parting comments. And remember, the subject is uprooting violent crime keys to success. So we want to hear some keys in there to success. I thank you. Thank you, moderator. Uh, <clears throat> I, I do believe that the discussion in itself was very healthy and that there's much I can take away from the intercourse but if there was one point that struck me fairly uh, consistently throughout the discussion has been the level of communication. And perhaps that is one of the areas that uh, we need to strengthen within our uh, strategic uh, allocation uh, and strategic deployment from time to time is how we communicate what we are aiming to communicate uh, to get from communication and as we always say if you see something say something but we go beyond that we go beyond uh just seeing and saying we want to create that rapport we want to create that trust uh so that you can feel the level of safeness within the context of your particular community or in the nation itself uh so there's this from us <clears throat> Uh, collaboration as part of the way forward, and I think that's a, uh, one of the key factors in, in, in going forward, the, the level of collaboration, whether you're a government entity, uh, NGO, whether you're a community group, uh, and whether you're an individual. Uh, we need to establish awareness 
And, and as one ad said, we need to see what you are seeing and you need to see what we are seeing in terms of coming to a, a solution. The other point is, and I, I stress that, that yes, there's fear of crime and fear of crime is not a bad, it's not a bad uh, 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 situation. Uh, it is the type of fear that envelops that that makes it you know uh, bad in 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 the sense of the word. Uh, but if we have the fear of crime, that we need to be alert. We need to, as I said before, see something, say something, get engaged with your police officers, uh, adopt a cop that kind of approach, and share the information. Uh, I I think that we would be on a better uh, plane, so to speak, in terms of coming to. Uh, a solution. The other solution is uh, accessibility and availability of, of guns to very young people. And, 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 and I, I said earlier in my comments that guns are, are, are distant weapons and that you don't need to be within six feet of an individual to, to do harm to an individual. You can be a distant off and yet you can be effective in, in creating the kind of injuries or the kind of harm that you want to create. So uh, we need to, to reduce the accessibility and the availability of, of farms. And again, uh, I, I think I still speaks to taking advantage of, uh, and, and we need to identify those persons who take advantage of and allow persons to to, to feel powered or empowered through a weapon. And, and again, I, I would emphasize the fact that if you see something, if you know something, if you have a thought and you want us to connect it for you, just let us know and we can we can probably find another dot to con, uh, connect so that we can have a, a, a safer society. So the, uh, the, the accessibility to to, of, of weapons to young persons is one of the concerns of the TPPS. Uh, and again, we look at the age range, uh, young adults, young, young persons uh, between the age of 16 and 18, and, and then young adults between uh, 18 and 25 are the persons that we are seeing with access to farms. Uh, and, and this cannot be this cannot be a, a good thing for a society uh, where, you know, there's a process involved if you want to have a farm. Now, uh, the, the other point that I, I need to, to make from listening to the discussion is that there are a number of risk factors out there that would uh, cause violence or cause uh, um, um, uh, misbehaviors or bad behaviors among the young people. Uh, again, uh, the key to that is, and I believe in the socialization at, at, at family level, I believe in the socialization at community level, and I believe in the socialization within the contents of the education system. So uh, they, they need to be that, that connectivity in terms of the entities, school, community, and uh, family in order to, to create, to raise the child that you want to raise in terms of uh, being the best within, within the, the society. I would want to go away thinking too that yes, that yeah, we understand the problem and we recognize that it's complex. We recognize that there is no easy, quick fix. And if there is a quick fix, it has to be you, it has to be me, it has to be the other uh, NGOs. If there is to be that quick fix, as I said, we in the organization uh, sometimes, uh, you know, constantly put the small forces whether or not it is worth our effort to run behind these small forces. But we recognize that if we don't do that, there, there are no other entities within society that 
takes on that responsibility. So uh, 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 what we consider to be, uh, what you consider to be trivial might be one point in our tough love administration uh, when it comes to, to, to law and order and public safety. So Mr. Manuel, I'm, I'm saying to you that yes, there was much talk, uh, food for thought in your, in your discussion. Uh, I am pleased to be and humble to be part of it and to hear the views of others, as I always say, uh, the views of others make the police stronger, stronger in terms of shaping strategies, stronger in terms of knowing that there are people out there who care about their safety, who care about others and others' safety. So I, I would want to, you know, uh, stroke the egos of those who participate and, and, and say to them, uh, uh, well done, uh, uh, you can rely on the TBPS for uh, the, the level of guidance and public safety interventions that we are so accustomed to. So thank you very much, Mr. Joseph. Thank you too for your invaluable contribution. Um, Aisten, you want um, your parting comments and what solutions you have up your sleeve? Um, you know, <laughs> my parting <laughs> comment is going to be small, right? Uh, I would really like to do is personally thank you, you know, me for inviting me, because you know, he's always, he's always called me when things happening. I know you're coming from a different forum and I give thanks for this. I will let you add them to the houses to do it too. So at the very main, start back up crime in different areas. I think I'm calling and asking me about the truth because the part of the truth that I did in this lower part of the city, all know it's still working, but as I was saying all along, that is like a coal, right? When, when, when the bigger people sneeze, then other people start to catch it, then do. So it, it don't just stay in one place. It's going all over the island because, you know what I mean, um, some people hear about it and some people ju just want to get involved, don't know what's going on, but just want to get involved. And as Mr. Boyd said, they start to get edgy and start to talk about disrespect and all sorts of things. But what we like to say is, is that, you know, um, guns don't kill people, people kill people. And I think that it's time that big men should sit down together and reason things without cursing. This is one of the things that's going to get us that I hate. I hate to see men, big men cursing with the F word, telling the one about the mothers and all these kind of things. And then the next day, they come back and they talk and then they go back to the same thing again. This is what them is really bring disrespect then. And these are things that they go cut out now and bring respect. Really, they should talk to the one another as men because you know, when we get when we get to the law courts, we can't talk down that's when the judges get to really parade cause, you know, we can't go in the judge, we can't go in the, the, the magistrate courts and call the judge big man and you know what I mean, all them kind of things. So I practice it over here now. Like what I do every day, I call the simplest man, sir or ma'am. You understand what I mean? Because I know that if I give these pleasant trees out here. When I go to any other place, I know where the misery is and I know how to conduct myself, right? And my journey is what lead me to where he is here today. I could come and speak. I don't speak on the things that I do because to me, that would be like glorifying the things that I do. But what I always do is try that when I see people going the wrong way, is try to tell them, no, don't do that. And don't feel that a man must live one way all the time. They got change out here and they got positive change too so when all this ghetto thing is over and the years start to creep in don't be too late come now and start to become a part of the system realize that it is is a country that we all got to live in and we got to raise with children because as bad as we is we still want the best of with children so if we want the best of with children we just show the best to other people's children too right but i hope the bigger media houses now we invite we and we panels and other people to come and speak and don't just like keep it in the confines of certain little areas because as much people hear me today, I don't think enough hear me. So the bigger media houses got to hear these things, 
You know, um, I call him Mr. Boy, so I tell him about Mr. Husbands and um, the other panelists. Thanks very much. You know, and let me keep talking because at least if I can save one soul and y'all can save one soul, then it will keep on like that. Yeah, and it, it, it won't be bad every day. You, you will get some good and positive results too. Thanks a lot, Barbados. And on behalf of me and the men in the ghetto, uh, we, we, you know, me, I, I trying to get everybody together, everybody that we could talk and earn out things before we, 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 um, we zoom into violence and crime and destroy every beautiful city because we, we build this city on tourism and these kind of things is bad for tourism because it's just right now we're hearing the opposition saying that when they was in uh, power, it was getting us all notifications from the Americans and the English and the Canadians and different things. But different sorts for different folks and Miss Molly doing a very good job by putting me out there in the national forum. So that that's one of the ways that I think that the pain she by not trying to bring she right down. So just don't think that it's all bad. Think that is is it, good too. And thanks again, Bobby. This. Thank you, Mr. Joseph. Thank you so much, Roger. Okay, so so just a few things. Uh, one is that uh, we, as I said, we're coming to the churches to look at the way that churches can assist, um, especially in block areas. I want to do some plotting in the areas uh, about two churches already, two denominations, sorry, already have uh, decided to employ the services so that we can go into the areas and start a plot where the gangs are, where the, the dangers are, where the drugs are, so forth. So churches are more empowered. The other thing is that what we want to do is Miss King has agreed to train people from our churches to do remedial classes. So if we can get churches, like even the Wesleyan Church here, to get one person from every single Wesleyan Church to get trained by Miss King on remedial classes, we want to send young people to your church who we have been able to go through the court system or probation or the Nichols or whoever, or police who send it to us. We want to be able uh, to, be, to send those young people to your churches to be learned because you have the infrastructure, you have the building. The other thing we want to do also is to provide to these young people constant service. So if every Wesleyan church in Barbados decide, look, I want to train one person in our church to do constant sessions or to be a counselor or a brief counselor, what we call a uh, brief intervention counselor, they can come out and get the training done so that we can send young people there. Right now, my office is inundated with so many young people. We have a long waiting list. Imagine, imagine if we had churches on board who would take some of these cases that they can work with the families, they can work with the children, and it can benefit the society. So these are the programs we're rolling out. I'm hoping that when it comes to the Wesleyan Church that we get some uh, some kind of little um, assistance there because it can work. We've already tried it with one church and that church has already tried to meet the needs of the society, especially young people. And young people are coming in their numbers to get the help from the church. Guys, we can do this thing. The answer is not in the government. The answer is not in the police. The answer is not in them kind of instructions. Actually, the church has the answer. We are able to help these people because God has allowed us to be blessed with the infrastructure, the building. And although we talk to the community centers, we can't hold it to the community centers because we want some place wholesome for these young people to go to, that the activities are wholesome, the people are, 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 um, are, are in the self you know, they feel safe in other words. So we want to be able to provide the churches with those things. And uh, plotting, again, will be your good plots, it will be your good strategies so that you can find out what's happening in your community churches. If the churches know what's happening, then they're able to structure their programs based upon that. So I want to say thank you very much again, Mother, for the opportunity to come. But there are solutions. We found them already. Parents, the, the bill app. If we can get our young people educated and the church can assist with those things, we can help these young people to become better citizens in our society. Thank you and God bless. Thank you so much, Roger. And I can assure you that the men's ministry of the KFL Wesleyan Holiness Church will be reaching out to you and with the aim of working alongside you um, because we need to work together so we can do much more. So you will be hearing from me uh, anytime soon, how we can actually get our men's ministry involved in reaching out and touching lives and, and making this Barbados a better place and to you know, reduce the, the incidence of crime and all other lawlessness and you know, get our productive society really going in the right direction. 
So I want to thank um, Sister Verney Sobers, um, Brother uh, Winston Eiston Branch, um, Deputy Commissioner of Police, Irwin Boyce, and you, Roger Husbands, of Drug Education and Counseling Services for taking the time out to be part of this very important conversation. And this, the subject was rooting out violent crime, keys to success. And this was organized by the Men's Ministry of the KFL Wesleyan Holiness Church and the director. And I want to say a thank you for those Jamaicans who joined us and uh, our brother who joined us from the US and who, who is from St. Kitts, but is living in the US. I want to thank you all for taking the time out to help us in this discussion and we move forward with all that we have uh, listened to tonight and we have gathered, we will really work on all these discussions and all these points as we go forward to make our young men, uh, the kind of young men that they ought to be. Thank you all and have a great night, what's left of it. Blessings. Thank you and blessings to you. Okay. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Bless Great good night start. to everyone. Good night. Bless the light. Bless the love, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Excellent program, Emmanuel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Blessings. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.